Hi everyone, I'm Matt from THKP, and today we're going to be taking a look at the IK Solver app that we built in our last video. Specifically, we're going to be adding some of the functionality that I teased at the end of that video. Namely, we're going to add a ball which the user can interact with using the arm. Before we get started though, I'll do a quick recap of what we're working with. So if we check the state of our app, the main thing we have right now is just our arm, which represents the model of the arm. So the locations of all the bones, we do a little bit of setup, we have a reset, and then for our build, we mainly just have a gesture detector, which is how we give the arm its new target. And we call arm.solve, which is how the arm sets its location so that it puts the hand, so to speak, at the location that the user requests. We have an on tap, which is just for convenience, we call reset. And then for actually drawing the arm, we have a stack where we have a positioned fill, which just takes the whole space of the stack and its only child is the arm, which uses the arm model that we referred to before, and it's responsible for actually drawing it to the screen. So that's, that's just a quick summary of, of what we're starting with today. So before we actually add the ball or implement gravity or collisions or anything like that, I'd actually like to take a step back and talk about view transformation. Now, this topic is slightly abstract, but it is a super useful concept and it allows us to do certain things that would be very difficult to do otherwise uh, or just tedious and, and error prone. So let's go over to this utility that I've uh, written called view transform. At a high level, the responsibility of view transform is to take a coordinate in one space, so to speak, and to transform it into another space. And if you've watched earlier videos of either John or mine, for example, the dinosaur video, we've talked about this concept before of spaces. Sometimes it's useful to have two different representations of a 2D space. And what this class allows is for you to say, okay, well, I want to take a coordinate in one of the spaces and then transform it into the other. For example, Let's say you had a game which you wanted to be 100 units wide. So let's say the coordinate in the top left is 0, 0, and the coordinate in the bottom right is 100, 100. But let's say you want to draw your game board you know, full screen, and let's say you have a weird display that's square for whatever reason, but let's say your display is 200 pixels wide. So you might want to decide to represent your display as a rectangle that has 0, 0 in the upper left-hand corner and 200, 200 in the lower uh, right-hand corner. Let's say you have characters in your game world. If you want to then decide where they need to map on the pixel world, sure, you could say, oh, well, I'll just multiply anything by 2, but if you wanted to do that with view transform, you'd say, okay, my from rectangle has 0, 0 in the top left and 100, 100 in the bottom right. And my to rectangle has 0, 0 in the top left and 200, 200 in the bottom right. And then the idea is that if you say, okay, here's a point in the world space, let me know what the location of that in pixel space is. And that is what the functionality of this forward method is. See, it accepts an offset and then it returns an offset. And, and more specifically, it accepts an offset in the coordinate space of the from rectangle and it returns a, an offset in the coordinate space of the to rectangle. So as I said before, it's kind of abstract, but it's a re really powerful tool. And so now that we kind of understand what the responsibility of view transform is, I'll just quickly kind of run through how we're performing this. So essentially what we do is we say we want to take the width of the, of the from rectangle, we take the width of the to rectangle, and then we find, okay, what is the relative scale? So in the case that we were just talking about before, our world space was 100 pixels wide, our pixel space is 200 pixels wide, 
So in our case, we're scaling up by two. So obviously that's kind of, you know, that's intuitive using these simple numbers, but it's the kind of thing where maybe when you have numbers that aren't quite so round, it's, it's much more useful to have something that is kind of handling this for us. And then we do the same thing in the Y dimension. We calculate the height of the rectangles and then we calculate their ratio. So we find out how, how they scale. Okay, so now we want to use our view transform to map between our world space and our screen space as, as discussed before. And here it, uh, is an opportunity for us to take a step back and think like, okay, what is a logical way to represent our world in this game? And in our case, eventually we're going to implement a game where the goal is for the user to be able to get the ball as high as possible. So a logical way to represent this game, I would argue, is to have zero be on the bottom and as y moves upward, the coordinate values for y increase. But that is not how, that is not how Flutter kind of works by default. Or, and especially in the case of the canvas in the custom painter, they have zero be in the top uh, left corner. So we will flip the y so that from the point of view of the game, when the ball is going higher, its Y value is increasing. And then we use our view transform to say, okay, well, where does that map onto for the screen? But before we do that, I do want to take a look at how things are working right now on the app. So, uh, so we still have our little arm. Its joints are like a little bit bigger just so that it's slightly easier to use when you're on a, touching on a real device. But aside from that, pretty much unmodified from where we left off at the end of the last video. But now we will update our arm to accept a, uh, a view transform. We need to import our view transform. And we're going to pass in our new view transform into our painter. And now our job is simple. We basically just have to take any place where we're using an offset and wrap it in uh, vt.forward. We are not passing in a vt into our arm yet. So let's do that. We'll construct a view transform at the top here. And as discussed, our view transform, except a rectangle that represents the from space and a rectangle that represents the to space. So in our case, I think it'll actually be easier to start with the two space. Our screen is modeled with the origin in the top left corner. So we'll construct a rectangle. And then we'll use LTRB that allows us to explicitly specify the locations of the left, top, right, and bottom sides. So left, zero, top, zero. Right should be the width of the screen. And then bottom should be the height of the screen. Okay, and now we just need to uh, construct this screen size.
Okay, so now we have our two rectangle and here's where things start to get a little bit interesting. I'm actually gonna copy this other rectangle. So as discussed before, we want the top of the screen to be higher values of Y. So right now the top of the screen is zero and the bottom of the screen is increasing values of Y. So we basically just need to stop, swap these so that the top of the screen represents the height of the screen in pixels and then the bottom of the screen is zero. So now this gives us a view transform that will swap the Y coordinates of anything that it's, it's passed into. So let's now finally pass this into our arm. Okay, so we see our arm again, and hopefully, somewhat unsurprisingly, it's now on the top of the screen pointing the other direction. And that's because we're just flipping everything around, where we've mirrored it over the y-axis. One interesting thing to note is we haven't flipped the touch coordinates. So we get this unusual behavior where the display of our arm has changed, but the input to our arm has, has not. So now what we need to do is translate the touch coordinates, which are happening in screen space, and now we need to translate those back into world space. And this is actually where the view transform is very cool because this is trivial. So all we need to do is say view transform dot backward. And now it's fixed. And if, if you hear a tremendous amount of excitement in my voice, this is because I implemented this by hand with just a, a bag of different ways on a case by case basis. And solving this problem was very error prone and things weren't lining up and I was doing the translations differently in different places. But View Transform swoops in, saves the day, makes this problem trivial. So, so that's why that's why I'm uh, very excited about this idea. So that represents the the introduction of actually using View Transform in our in our app. So, we're done with View Transform for the moment, and now I think it makes sense for us to add our ball. So the first thing we can do is just add a new positioned child. And our ball is just going to be a container and we'll give it a box decoration to make it round. Okay, so now we have our red ball. It's not in the right place, but it's on the screen. So let's add a little bit of state to keep track of where the ball should be. Let's move our arm down. We'll want it on the lower portion of the screen. So if we do screen height divided by four, that should do it for us. And then we'll use the same value for the ball.
All right, so let's actually consume our ball world lock when we're drawing our ball. And we'll subtract half of the width of the ball size so that the center of the ball lands on the location of the ball. It's in the corner right now just because it's using that initial zero coordinate, but now we see the ball up high and that's because we are not using our view transform on the location of the ball. So let's construct a ball screen lock. And our ball is in the right the right place now. So we can't interact with it at all. It doesn't, we don't, we're not doing collisions or anything, but it it is there and it's using our view transform. Our next step is going to be a, to apply gravity to the ball. So we are going to have a few more bits of state in our app. Let a new offset called velocity. Now we are going to want an animation controller because we're going to want these regular ticks to animate at 60 frames per, per second. Previously, we were able to just hook into the refresh rate of the drag update events, but now we want the ball to respond even when we're not touching the screen. So let's add a new animation controller. And so we've got our classic, just infinite animation controller that just ticks forever. And we'll just, we'll start it immediately. And we will add an update method, which is going to be a listener for this controller. And we are going to hold on to a reference to the previous time that uh, update was called. So if you're not familiar, last elapsed duration is just a duration that is available on the controller, which tells you how much time has elapsed since the animation controller started. And Actually, uh, let's grab a uh, reference to that at the beginning of the method. We'll say, okay, and now we're maintaining this last update call state, so we can calculate the elapsed time in seconds. So let's do that. So this will be a double. Okay, so now we have the elapsed time in fractional seconds. And first we'll say that the location ball world lock plus equals ball world velocity times So basically ball world velocity is in in units per second. And so we wanna make sure that we're multiplying it by the number of seconds that have elapsed to calculate the new ball world location. And since we want to implement gravity, we're going to add kind of a downward force on the velocity every, every time we call update as well.
So in case you're not familiar, offsets have a translate method that just allows you to essentially add another offset to it. We are translating the ball world velocity by gravity times elapsed time seconds. And gravity, it's not, uh, it's not some global constant in Dart. It's just something we've, we've defined up at the top of our file before. So let's go back to our update method. So now this should be enough to start observing gravitational effects on our ball. But we don't see anything. Let's refresh. Okay, still nothing. But that's because we've initialized this animation controller, but we're not using an animated builder to build our ball. So let's go down and add that below. Okay, so quick note, I've mentioned before that it makes sense to wrap your animated builders as tightly as possible. And the corollary to that is if you have many things that, that all do need to get updated in response to updates to the animation, you may as well wrap all of them together in one animated builder, just so that the code is a little bit neater because the, the multiple animated builders do tend to clutter the, the widget tree up a little bit in my experience. Okay. So we, we just use the auto suggestion and we translate it into an animated builder. Okay, and it's also important that we move anything that will be affected by the value of the animation into the body of the animated builder. So we calculate our ball screen lock in the body of our builder. And now we should start to see updates. So let's refresh our app. I made a subtle mistake here. We don't want to call update when we're uh, adding listener. And now we see our ball full. Okay, and we can just tap to get the ball to reset. And it looks like I am never resetting the velocity in reset, so let me add that. So if we tap, it should start from zero now. Nice. And now we have uh, gravity affecting our ball. Now we will add the ability for the arm to interact with the ball. So we will have to add collision detection for our arm. And so this is something that I already have implemented. I will talk you through it but we won't implement it live here. So let's go over to anchor.dart. And so we have this new method called overlaps, which returns an offset, which indicates the magnitude and direction of the overlap between the defined circle as specified by the parameters and the arm. So at a high level, the approach is check for collisions between the anchor and the ball, and then check for collisions with the two child bones. And then at any point, if we see that there's a collision, we return that the offset that corresponds with that, that overlap. When it gets down to it, we're actually only doing two things. We're calculating the overlap between two circles, or we're calculating the overlap between a line and a circle. So circle circle overlap is very simple. You just uh, calculate the difference between their centers and then if the distance between their centers is less than the sum of their radii you know that they're overlapping. And then the direction of the overlap is just the angle that the two centers make. 
So when we compute the offset, that is the subtraction of the, the location of the arm from the center. And then this offset provides the direction that we use when we're returning the offset for this, this overlap case. And then bone intersection is only slightly more complicated. So let's pop over here. So here we, we're doing um, the same thing as below. This is just circle, circle intersection again. But here we do uh, circle line intersection. And let's take a look at that. And this is really just a thin wrapper around calculating point to uh, line segment distance. And so if we calculate that the distance between the uh, center of the circle and the closest point on the line, then that is less than the radius of the circle plus half of the line width, then we know that they're overlapping. And just to look at what dist to line segment is, this is probably the most complicated part of the, the collision detection algorithm. So essentially what we do, we calculate the offset that represents the line segment by doing end minus start. If it's a zero length segment, we, we just return center minus start. That gives us the, the distance between the center and the point. It's actually, it isn't even the line segment at that point. And this section is actually us finding the dot product between the the offset that represents, you know, the, the line segment itself and the offset that is the center of the circle minus the start point of the line segment. And what taking the dot product gives us is the amount of distance that the that line segment between the start and the center projects onto the, the line segment. And what that allows us to find is the point on the line segment that is the closest to the point that we're trying to find the distance from. And then we use the dot product to find that point. We just construct the offset between those two points and we return that. And that gives us the distance and the direction between the point that we've provided and the closest point on the line segment. So hopefully that, that kind of makes sense. So, in, so that gives us this, this offset that we have here. We use that to determine if this distance is closer than the radius plus the, the half of the line width. And if that's the case, then we return that because there's an overlap in that case. And that completes bone intersection. So we, we check if, is there a, an intersection between the ball and the actual, the line of the bone? Is there an intersection between the joint of the bone? And if either of those return an offset, we return that to the, the user. And, and then that makes up our overlaps method. Now that we have our implementation for overlaps, let's see how we can put that into use in our main file. Okay, so we will call this from update and we can say, okay, so we call overlaps on our arm with the ball world lock and the ball size divided by two. Um, and if they don't touch at all, overlap will be null. But let's, so let's do a check if overlap is not equal to null. So ball world lock minus equals overlap. So we, we kind of want to push the ball back in the direction that the overlap is pointing uh, so that it doesn't continue to intersect with the arm. And actually, we can grab a reference to the prior ball world lock. So 
So now this starts to get into uh, kind of a judgment call about what looks good, how physics should work in this game world. But one implementation that I thought looked, looked pretty good was to compute the distance of, or the difference between the new location and the previous location. And that makes the new velocity. So intuitively, if there's a big overlap, that means that the arm was swinging quickly and that the ball should be imbued with a high velocity. We'll just uh, wrap this in a check to make sure we're not dividing by zero. And now let's take a look at how this looks. There we go. So now we're able to hit our ball. All right, now with our collision detection, we can give the ball a good whack and it easily flies off the top of the screen. Uh, so I think what we should do is make it so that the view of the app zooms out when the ball is about to go off the screen. So this is gonna be kind of a, a payoff for the view transform because this should allow us to pretty simply update our app so that we get this kind of zooming out behavior. Let's go down to our build method where we're constructing our view transform. And we are going to need to update the view transform every time the animation controller ticks because as the ball is moving upward we have a different view on the app so we're going to need to move some of this into the the animated builder the but it's also the case that our gesture detector is using the view transform as well for the purposes of this video it, these gesture detectors are just going to use the unmodified view transform that is just this simple app just because by the time the view on the app is changing, it's not possible to hit the ball anyway. So, so that's just why we will leave this view transform up here. All right, so we will create a new view transform here. And the new view that we want is the height of the current height of the ball plus a little bit of the screen. So we want to just like give a little bit of a gap so that the ball isn't right at the top. So the way we will accomplish that is we'll say, okay, the top of the screen should be at uh, ball world location dot d y and then we've defined the, we've defined this constant earlier it's just called ball buffer and so this we want this to be the new height of the view but we also want to scale uniformly so we're gonna we want to scale the x and the y direction the same so let's divide this by the screen size dot height so we construct this view scale which takes into account where the current ball is and it divides the screen height by that but one thing we don't want to do is scale the screen down if the ball is below a certain point. So we want view scale to be at least one, maybe more if the ball is higher. So let's say max of So we take the maximum of either this ball world lock plus ball buffer divided by screen height or one. So we make sure we're not zooming in when the ball is clo closer to the player. So now let's construct a view size. So view size is just the screen size times the view scale. Another thing that I want to note is that we want the existing view of the 
app to be centered as the scale grows. If we just anchor it at the left edge as it grows, the view of the app is gonna kind of look like it'll slide over to the left. So we need to add a little kind of gutter on either side so that when it scales up, it, it's centered. So let's calculate the size of that gutter. So now I think we have all of the, our pieces in place to update the from rectangle. So the left edge is no longer going to be zero. As discussed, we want to have that little bit of padding so that we keep the screen centered. So we're gonna say negative gutter. Screen size that height, no. Well, now we want to use the view size that height. We also want to use view size dot width. But now since we ha uh, have moved the screen over by a uh, gutter is width, we want to subtract gutter. And that should define the new world view rectangle. And then two doesn't change because that's defined by the screen size. So let's give this a shot. Okay. So you start to see some crazy stuff. This definitely is not what, what we want. So if we're zooming out, we would expect the, the arm to scale uniformly down, but we f see that it, it looks like it narrows in the X direction and it actually lengthens in the Y direction. This actually indicates an issue with our view transform code. And so if we go over to the implementation of that, we actually see that there's an issue with our Y scale. Our Y scale is backwards and that, that kind of makes intuitive sense, right? Where we want X and Y to be scaling down and X seems to be scaling down, but Y is scaling up. So that's kind of how we can get a sense that, that we've got a bug in our view transform code. Now, if we go back to main, So let's save it all and we'll give it another shot. All right, nice. So we are seeing our app scaled down in both directions. One issue is that before we were just flipping the view. So we weren't doing any scaling at all. So it didn't matter that we weren't scaling the size of the spheres or the width of the line, it was still working fine. But now we should go over to our arm widget and update these. So we will say VT dot scale forwards. Now, if we give it a shot, we see our, our arm shrink. Okay, one issue you might be able to see is that our ball is not scaling and we'll go over to main to address that. And all we need to do is do the same thing where we can say vt.scale forwards.
And now we see that our ball scales right alongside our, our arm. So now we are successfully scaling our view so that we can continue to see the ball as it zooms up into the sky. Obviously, there are still a lot of different things we could do to kind of improve this and make this more game-like, but for the purposes of this video, we will call it here. So thank you for joining me on this journey and keep an eye out for future THKP videos. Thanks for checking out this tutorial. If you found this useful, give us a thumbs up. And if you're interested in seeing more, don't hesitate to subscribe.